welcome to the July Higher Ed Tableau user group. Um, normally, Ginny is the one who does these intros. Today, it's all me, so bear with me as I uh, probably butcher everything uh, for the day. Um, but I hope everyone's excited. We've got a really great lineup ahead, um, and I'm going to skip through to our agenda. You're going to hear some music really quick. Just ignore it. <laughs> all right, there we go. Um, so we're going to start off with some announcements. Uh, we'll do our Meet a Community member, uh, Andrew Drinkwater. Um, Julia Buchting uh, will uh, tell us about transparent shapes um, and what you can do with them in Tableau. Um, Jeannie and I did a pre-recorded uh, session on uh, date calculations. It's the final, final uh, one of our tips and tricks sessions on calculations. Um, and then we'll have time at the end to do uh, some wrap up and chat. So. I'm going to open up the floor for announcements. Um, if anyone has a job op opening or wants to make any other announcements, feel free to unmute yourself, add it to the chat. Um, we also have an open uh, positions Slack channel, which I'm going to put into the chat in just a second. Um, apparently talking and copying and pasting, hard to do at the same time. Um, so feel free to post open positions there as well. So uh, yeah, give everyone, if anyone wants to unmute, feel free to do so. So it looks like CSU LB and Long Beach <laughs> is hiring uh, a this admin. Um, Tammy, if you have a link to that, go ahead and put it in the open channels, um, or sorry, open positions Slack, uh, Slack space. Um, and yeah. All right. If no one else has any announcements, we're going to go ahead and get started with our media community member. Um, so. Andrew Drinkwater, you guys might have seen him already. He did a great session on uh, joins and relationships um, in Tableau, the whole new, new as of like what version 2020, 2019.4, something like that, um, data model in Tableau. Um, and we're going to chat with him. So he is the host of the Canadian Higher Education Tableau user group. I didn't know there was one of those um, until we started talking to Andrew. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Um, he's also a former Tableau instructor at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. You might have heard a lot of Vancouver references throughout the uh, the intro tunes, and that's all because of Andrew. Um, he's a, a Tableau certified associate and also a board member at the Canadian Association of Institutional Research and Planning, which is abbreviated SERPA. I'm assuming there's a reason that those those uh, the, the acronym doesn't follow the 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 English uh, name of that organization. Um, and he's also the president and founder of Plan Analytics, um, which builds strategic enrollment management analytics solutions for colleges and universities. Um, so in a second, I will put all of Andrew's links into the chat. Again, that whole like copying and pasting and talking. It's hard. It's hard. Oh, hey, that's why the 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 uh, the acronym doesn't doesn't work the way I, I said it because I had it wrong. Canadian Institutional Research and Planning Association (SERPA). Now it all makes sense. Um, so Andrew, if you want to go ahead and unmute. So uh, the way this is going to work is uh, uh, we have a whole list of questions. It's the same questions we ask every single time we do this. Um, so I'm just going to ask Andrew some questions, and he's going to answer them until we run out of time. And then at the end, uh, we're going to have uh, some summer slash Canada slash Justin Trudeau, Trudeau related lightning round questions. Um, the, the Justin Trudeau ones are my favorite. So, <laughs> um, so welcome, Andrew. Um, I think you are still muted. Now you are not. Thank you very much. Nice to see everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time in July. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know I did that that spiel uh, that we had all typed up, but uh, can I tell us a little bit about yourself and what your role is um, and how how your team or, you know, works with Tableau? OK, yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Andrew Drinkwater. I am now the president of a company called Plaid Analytics. But let me tell you a little bit about how I got into higher education in the first place. Uh, so I began my career in higher ed as an academic advisor and student recruiter at a university called Simon Fraser. That started the oh, the Sorry music. about that. That's Apparently, okay. I can't mute my headphones <laughs> or it starts music. <laughs> nice. Um, I got that job in part because I was a leader in the student community and one of the very peculiar things that happened in the juncture that I began as a student was another public university was closed down and taken over by SFU, which had all manner of curricular changes associated with it. So I was the person that helped 
the administration figure out how do we offer the right curriculum to the right students at the right time who are all coming from this phased out university and trying to find their way in a new university. So, so it's a very S peculiar SFU, challenge. SFU is Simon Fraser? That's correct, yeah. Okay. SFU is Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, okay. Canada. Um, and in that juncture, we grew a lot. I'd like to say this was because of my recruiting skills, but I really don't think I had too much to do with it. And we grew about fourfold in three years, which when you work in private industry is awesome. And when you work for the government is a real challenge because the money doesn't keep up with that kind of growth. So suddenly we had all these students, nobody to teach them. And this was my start in analytics. Um, a short while after this, so circa 2007, uh, I found Tableau through an ad on the internet uh, and discovered that I could do the same things I used to do in Excel that took me hours every week to do. I could do this in minutes in Tableau. And it was the start of a long journey with an amazing tool uh, that I'll so tell you a little bit more about today. What version of Tableau was that back in 2007? Like version <laughs> one, four, something so like that? Not quite version one. I'm not that old okay. in software years, but I'm getting up there. Um, so that was version 3.0. Uh, wow. And the key feature that was introduced in 3.0 to the best of my recall now was dashboards. So those didn't exist up until that point. Um, shortly after uh, I joined the Tableau community, uh, Tableau launched version 4.0. It had the earliest versions of maps. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So in Tableau years, I'm pretty old. Uh, I worked for SFU for over a decade, and then uh, after that, moved to the University of British Columbia, which nominally is their crosstown rival, and I was responsible for admissions data warehousing and enrollment and tuition forecasting there. Um, in 2016, saw an interesting opportunity to help many institutions as opposed to one, and so we started a company focused on higher education, analytics, and Tableau is a big part of what we do today. So what's in, in your, in all of, you know, the entire time that you've been in sort of the higher ed space, what's, uh, you know, what's your favorite project that you've worked on? So there's been a lot of them. We've worked on some really, really cool stuff. Um, but recently we are in the closing stages of a major analytics project with the California Community College. And for that, we have built a combination of an automated data pipeline, data warehouse, uh, hundreds of visualizations and associated data governance tools. Um, so within that, there was a lot of different bodies of work that were all really interesting. But for me, the one that really was fascinating was bringing together learning outcomes for particular courses or programs with actual assessments that instructors had done in course sections that were offered the courses that the college had on the books relative to those that could have been offered, instructor information and institutional goals, like how often you should assess a particular outcome or how often an instructor should be conducting an assessment. Bringing together all of those were, were an interesting challenge because every single one of them was in a different system and every single one of them was at a different level of aggregation. So Tableau's of relationship <laughs> data model, of course it was, yeah. Tableau's <laughs> relationship data model really helped us to put together that data in a way that was meaningful um, so that we could do that kind of analysis, but it was definitely an interesting challenge to bring it together in the first place. So that's really cool. I mean, it sort of is the, the let's let's just bring all of this related data together and actually do something useful. Not not look, look at one tiny aspect or one pocket of it, but actually sort of go, it's not necessarily end to end because you're not talking like, let's go from application all the way through, but like, but being able to tie, tie all of what's in the course catalog out to what are the outcomes and, and, and how, you know, and the, the, the actual course assessment assessments is pretty cool. Um, so you talked a little bit about how you use relationships in that in that process. So is that like how how do you use Tableau at work? Like what what are the different aspects of Tableau that you use and, and what do you focus on the most? So these days for me, I think actually the relationship model is one of the most interesting pieces is how do you bring together all this information that lives in your data warehouse or similar and Additionally, you know, spreadsheets and cloud systems and so on. How do you model that in such a way that you can really answer key questions like, are my instructors actually doing their assessments according to the plan? Uh, for example, in relation to what I talked about earlier. So I think for me right now, the data modeling is the most fascinating piece, um, but I have always had a soft spot for the visual analytics part of it as well. So how do we design something that is interesting to users that helps them answer questions that they've come in with and maybe some that they haven't in a way that's not overwhelming by putting you know 20 visuals on the same dashboard and saying, okay, here's the kitchen sink, good luck. Um, I've always found the visual analytics process and 
using those best practices and engaging with the actual users to try and figure out what problems they're solving uh, to be really meaningful as well. So probably data engineering and working directly with users to solve their problems are the two most passionate parts related to Tableau for me right now. So, so none of those is actually a Tableau feature. So what is your favorite Tableau feature? Ooh, um, you know, I, even though this began in like the late 2000s when I first started using Tableau, I would still say maps are my favorite feature. And the reason for that is that I find them to be a gateway for those who may be a little bit more data averse, who are newer to making decisions with lots of data and who often whose experience with data is somebody gives them this massive spreadsheet and they don't know where to begin. Maps are a way to open people's eyes to context that they do understand and augment that with data that maybe they're newer to, or maybe they know is there, but they've never seen it presented in a way that's interesting and engaging for them. And I find maps is a good starting point for those kinds of conversations. So those are my so favorite. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, you know, my experience has always been, okay, we have data to map, but either there's too much that isn't really useful. It doesn't really lead us, lead us or the users anywhere. Um, or, well, it's all financials. What are we what are we mapping with financials or with HR data like that, you know, that is actually actually actionable. So outside of something like facilities work or, you know, what how do you use maps? Like tell me more about how maps work with higher education data. <laughs> Yeah, so my background comes a lot from the admissions and enrollment side of, of the university. And so in that context, where I found it really interesting, especially was working both with recruitment and with financial aid. So depending a little bit on the institution, this moves around a touch for priorities, but helping recruiters figure out where would be great places for them to invest additional efforts to help applicants become aware of our institution or uh, convert uh, into admits uh, or, um, or registrants eventually when you get there. That can be a key part of the process in sort of the recruitment side of the enrollment funnel. Um, where financial aid can come into it is that you may have a variety of underrepresented groups who are eligible for certain kinds of financial aid. So maybe that's a Pell Grant in the US. There's other things mm -hmm. in Canada that are kind of targeted at the same idea. Um, combining that with what you know about where applicants are coming from or could be coming from can be a really good way to help underserved groups be able to discover education in a way that they hadn't historically been able to. So you can identify communities that maybe have a higher need for financial aid support um, and target your efforts to make sure that those communities are aware of the supports that are available and also provide corresponding academic support. They, those students may well be the first student in their family who's ever applied to a university or college, and they might need a different leg up than students from a different community. And so we can help them be successful right from the very beginning of their interactions as a prospect or even before with an institution if we use data in an effective way. And where I find maps comes into that is it really helps it really helps people contextualize where that information is in the communities that they're already, especially those that they're already familiar with. But the maps also work better when they're used in conjunction with other data. So I find maps can highlight certain kinds of high level trends pretty effectively. But if they're paired with you know, bar charts or line charts or other more advanced forms, it can open up an additional conversation. So I could click on a particular community on a map and then I could get additional context about that from other charts to really help me understand the demographics that I'm working with. It's all the magic of the dashboard, that uh, Tableau 3.0 uh, new feature. It really, right. you know, it's that in action. Nice. Um, so that actually sounds really great. Like I, you know, again, my, my experience has been like maps don't really help us very much, but I can see that that being really useful in that enrollment sense. And I, I know I've, it's also been good news for um, folks on the sort of the alumni relations um, side as well, trying to figure out, okay, again, we're still talking prospects, just prospects in a different lens. That's great. Um, so you've been in Tableau for a while. What, what is it that you don't know about Tableau that you would like to learn more about? One thing I've always found really fascinating and pretty unique to the Tableau community from what I've seen is that every time I think I'm almost at an advanced level, I find some new and interesting things to learn. And some of this is because the community turns Tableau into something far beyond what I think the base tool was built to do. 
Uh, and sometimes it's because Tableau's research and development has brought in new features that kind of extend where the tool can go. And so there's always something new and interesting to learn from others in this community. To me, that's really cool. For the things I'd love to learn more about right now, um, a really narrow use case is around parameters and shared data sources on Tableau server or Tableau cloud. I still find that there's moments where I go, this behaves a little bit differently than I was hoping it would. And I think there's an additional best practice I need to pick up on around how to share parameters across multiple workbooks. Um, so that that's a really narrow one. And then a little bit more broadly, uh, table calcs still take some practice for me. Oh my um, God. <laughs> so I find that I'm constantly editing them to try and get them just so. And when I get them, I'm so happy about it. But I still feel like I can cut that cycle a little bit shorter and that there's some additional things I can learn to, to get it right the first time. But I love how easy it is to interactively explore them to get them right. Yeah. But I still want to get the right answer right away every time. So right, that's right. what like I'm there's, hoping there's, to learn more about. There's a lot that Tableau will, will sort of do for you. But then it's that, that extra level of, okay, now I want to repeat this. Do I, do I need to go through hoops to try to get Tableau to do it for me? Or can I, can I actually take, you know, learn from what I've done already and try to try to do it again on the first go or on a, maybe a second or third go. Uh, there's always a lot, a little bit of trial and error with, uh, at least for me with table calcs and with a lot of other things, but especially table calcs, I, I never trust myself with them. Um, so what one thing would you uh, wish that you could tell Tableau newbie you? Right, so Tableau newbie, newbie me, uh, wishes that he'd realized that the order that you click things really matters in the beginning. So if you double click a dimension first and then a measure, you get a table. If you double click a measure first and then a dimension, you get a chart. And this sequencing has saved me tons of time in the earliest parts of building visualizations that it took me 10 years to realize, which is kind of embarrassing, but it's been there for a long time and it's really helpful sometimes. Yeah, I, I tend to, to always do it in the, the wrong order that gives me a table when I don't want it to give me a table. And I still haven't trained myself to, to wait, wait, pause, pause. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, what tab, a lot of folks use Tableau, you know, for their job, but they also do Tableau outside of their job. So um, do you do you use Tableau outside of work? And if so, how do you use it? I use it a little bit outside of work. So sometimes there's fun projects that uh, just catch my eye that might be interesting. So one that I do have on my Tableau public profile that anybody can feel free to download and play with is around transit scheduling. So it, this one was Wellington, New Zealand transit data uh, from a few years ago, it, it's out of date now. Uh, but looking at how can we visualize that in the form that you might see in your Outlook calendar and the reason why this is posted there is this can actually be really useful in higher education when you're trying to understand scheduling data. So for example, if you had a course scheduling policy that says some percentage of your courses can be delivered in prime time and the rest have to be outside of that, what would happen if you move the goalposts on prime time? So visualizing data in that schedule grid looking way is a good way to look at what that might mean. Um, the that's, one that's a really great way there, to tie it back. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like tie, tie it back to work. The, these fun projects aren't just for fun. You can actually learn from them. Uh, I find I learn, I, I do them for fun first, and then I start dreaming of the ways they could be applied to work, and they end up in both places. Um, the other one that was pretty cool that's not there yet is I decided I wanted to read more and use my phone less. And so uh, I discovered that my e-reader has a SQLite database behind it. So if you have a Kobo, that's true for you as well. And you can import that data into Tableau. So in my case, I, I did a few different things. So the Kobo data from the SQL Lite, or SQLite database, uh, the time tracking for a time tracker that I use. So I also logged the time to say, if I'm gonna increase my reading time, I better know what my baseline is. Uh, and then I tried, uh, but failed eventually with importing Apple's screen time measurements to compare how I was using my phone to my reading. And so I made good progress there, but there at the time, and I believe it's still true, there was no API from Apple to pull that data out. So I was entering it manually and I grow impatient with manual data entry as I'm sure many of you can relate. But that was a fun one to see how I'm doing relative to my goal of increasing my reading. And I can say about three years out that I'm reading way more than I used to. And part of this was because I had the visualization to help me understand how that was going. Yeah, it's one of those things like you, if you're not tracking the data or actually when you start tracking the data, you actually start maybe changing your behavior to, to make the data look a little bit better. <laughs> uh, 
and in in some 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 you know aspects it, it works like it does for for those personal goals and sometimes we'll see people trying to gain metrics once they realize what those metrics are on the work side so kind of a double short too, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, I, but i i love that you know that that but let's let's try to, to to quantify our life a little bit and and see how we can you know improve on on ourselves um so this is the last official question before we get into the lightning round is there anything else that you want to share with us I will just say out loud that as somebody else who's organizing a Tableau higher ed related user group, you folks are doing an amazing job of hosting this session uh, and happy one year anniversary, but I have nothing else. Oh, thank to you. Share. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, now we get into the lightning round. So what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Just so you know, it is national ice cream month and in the US, it's an official holiday and everything. No, it's not. Um, last Sunday was National Ice Cream Day. Again, not really an official holiday. Um, but what what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? So, because I'm so into health, uh, mocha almond fudge. Ooh, I, I can I can handle the fudge part. I don't know, I don't know that I'd, I'd want to mix the rest. But to each their own. Um, so we had to do some some googling here. Um, so Ben and Jerry's or President's Choice ice cream, or do you have another favorite ben. Canadian brand? Uh, there's one in Vancouver called Ernest Ice Cream that's really good, but of the two that you've got here, I'd pick Ben and Jerry's. All right. Um, daiquiris, because again, it's the middle of the summer. Summer is really hot sometimes. So daiquiris, frozen or classic? Uh, frozen. Okay. Um, again, we did some Googling, and apparently the Canadians have some interesting uh, chip flavors. So uh, dill pickle or ketchup chips? I think I'd go for the dill pickle. Have you actually had either of these varieties? I've had both of them and I'm not actually a fan of either, but they are unique. If you had a favorite potato chip flavor, what is that that, that flavor? Mm, I think jalapeno for me. Okay. Um, so we are almost smack dab in the middle of two, two Vancouver slash Canada related holidays. We've got Canada Day was a few weeks ago. British Columbia Day is coming up in a couple weeks. So uh, which one do you prefer? Hmm. I think I prefer Canada Day because there's more events that you can go to. Okay. And then um, I can't remember why exactly, but we had to have a, a lollipop chart versus candy bar chart uh, option on here so lollipop charts or candy okay. bar charts i've never seen a candy bar chart i'm gonna go with that because it looks cool all right and then because you know french fries or poutine poutine and poutine. my favorite oh sorry sorry how do you say it poutine uh, i'm pretty sure it's poutine in in all french right. but i'm not french so i probably got it wrong too all right well i i will always get it wrong um, so this is this is a repeat from from last month, um, but Pierre Trudeau or Justin Trudeau in their you know Canadian tuxedos. I never realized how much they look alike. Wow. Uh, <laughs> let's say Pierre Trudeau. Um, do you own a Canadian tuxedo, or could you could you make one out of your 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 wardrobe? I do not. The best I got for you is this coffee cup. Awesome. And of course, it has maple syrup on it. with the passport. <laughs> um, and then one last Justin Trudeau question. What do you think of his new haircut? I got to be honest, anybody who can make news about their haircut is pretty amazing to me. But uh, I, I've heard that he's being compared to Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber and find the resemblance hilarious. That, but, that's uh, the only reason yeah, I mean, it came maybe... to my attention was was because it came up in the news as as hey look at this so right? sorry <laughs> yeah maybe he's trying to convey that he's 10 years younger and that he wants to run for pm for a good long time uh and it, this definitely makes him look younger than the previous haircut and maybe he'll have competition for uh most stunning looking uh world leader uh, over the coming years and he's just trying to prepare for that competition i i, I like that i like that answer so Thank you so much um, for being our Meta community member this this month, Andrew. Um, every, we do one of these every single month. So if uh, you out in the audience are interested in being asked a whole bunch of questions and answering these random lightning round questions, um, feel free to contact us on the 
we have a, a presenter form, which I will share later in the meeting. Um, and yeah, so thanks again, Andrew. Uh, we are going to now move on to our next presentation. Um, let me, it's one of those things again, it's uh, let me let me unpin you. <laughs> and then uh, we are going to uh, learn about transparent shapes from uh, Julia Buchting. Um, so welcome, Julia. Um, so Julia is an artist who actually trans transitioned into data art back in 2019. Um, and since her first encounter with Tableau, she knew that data viz is where, you know, it was her true calling. Um, so as an artist, she has a unique perspective on visual communication of quantitative data. Um, and her latest pet peeve is user experience design for data products. And I am on that same soapbox with you, Julia. <laughs> um, she is uh, the leader of the, the, the TUG in Munich in Germany. Um, and she's also a mentor for women in tech uh, with coffeecodebreak.de. Uh, um, and if she's not visiting, you can find her in her art studio, printing and pouring concrete, which I think is a fascinating topic and perhaps something for, for a later uh, media community member session. Um, but Julia is here not to talk about concrete um, <laughs> or, or about printing, um, but about transparent shapes. So um, Julia, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. So can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. So I'm going to start to share my screen and then um, I'll take five minutes uh, to, to just so starting my screen sharing now. Okay, good. So uh, yeah, first of all, um, so my hacks for transparent shapes, sorry, the lighting is really bad. It's, it's getting dark here in Germany. Um, my hacks for transparent shapes are on my Tableau public page. And you can reread all the hacks that I'm going to show you today um, over there. Also, please uh, join me on LinkedIn where I post about my activities. I'm a leader of the tag and also doing um, mentoring, as uh, Roshni has uh, mentioned. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to present, represent also career changers there because I changed career from art to data art. And I've actually talked to some of, um, uh, some of the employees in America who are working with the university trying to change more into a data viz job there. So I'm really happy that, uh, yeah, also the mentoring community is so connected and um, uh, yeah, I would love to show you Coffee Code Break, but as you can see, I'm having some trouble loading new tabs. I have no idea why, but I'm not taking any chances. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's leave it at that. So today I want to show you how to um, create transparent shapes and how to use them in a viz because that's quite hacky. Uh, they come in quite useful. They can make um, your viz look uh, quite a bit better um, if you know about them and know how to use them. So first of all, let's create a transparent shape together. If you're on your PC, please feel free to follow me. So open PowerPoint. Um, I think this is easiest and add in a shape. I usually just take a rectangle. It doesn't have to be big. Um, and I take that rectangle and I um, put the filling on no filling. And it's important that it's not white. It should be no filling at all. And um, then I, I put the form, so the, um, right, the lining on no contour at all. And now I have this transparent shape uh, in PowerPoint and now I need to save it. And the thing is, if you, I need to click on it and you can see that my cursor only uh, shows up or flares up when I hit the outline of my shape. So be sure to find that outline and then click on it. Um, it go to your, um, your right mouse click and save it as, a, um, as a, a picture. And here comes the tricky part. Now we want to save it in our Tableau repository. So go to documents and then find your Tableau repository and find shapes. And here we will uh, create a new folder and I'm calling this um, HeTag Invisible Shape because I've done this talk uh, once or twice before, so I'm having quite a lot of um, shape files already. And uh, yeah, 
well, it'll save our invisible shape right here. Um, so I lost my heat tag. All right, so now we're leaving PowerPoint behind and uh, um, never coming back as well. So now you're certainly wondering what can you do with invisible shapes? Let's start kind of basic, right? So let's start with having like an indicator, like, oh, is it going up or down? Is our profit ratio positive or negative or neutral? And uh, let's look at this visualization right here where, you know, it looks all right, but then we come to the point, to the um, part where we don't want to have an indicator because it's neutral. And here you can see on the mouse over that I'm seeing a white, an outline of a white shape. And this is because we have a, a um, calculated field on our color that determines if something is um, has a positive pr um, profit ratio, a negative profit ratio, or ne neutral. And here you can see that neutral is just a white color, um, and that our max card shows uh, that it's a circle. So now I want to show you how it looks like with an invisible shape. So you have your max, but Alas, where there's no shape at all, we don't see an outline. We do see a tooltip, however, but we don't see that same outline that we see on the other side. And when you um, click on an outline, you can actually select it. And here it's not possible to select um, this. So let's look into it. And here you can see that our max card is on shape. And uh, yeah, let's. Let's build that viz from uh, scratch to see how that goes. So let's pick uh, country and region. And uh, I have already um, prepared a field uh, called profit ratio. And uh, now I'm uh, switching to shape. trying to get that label out of the way. Okay, that will do for the moment. So um, I'm putting my uh, shape um, uh, field, profit ratio shape. I use a calculated field to uh, get these three different categories um, to have a shape for each one of them on shape. And uh, as you can see, it's already assigned this. Uh, if I actually, if I change this, it will influence the, um, the other visualizations as well, but let's, um, let's do it. So when I go and enter and go into my shape menu, I select a shape palette. And uh, first of all, I have to reload shapes because I've just loaded in the new and in invisible transparent shape, looking where we can find it. So here we are, he took invisible. I can select it, I can assign it to neutral, I click OK. And here I have included an invisible shape among, um, yeah, among clickable shapes in my visualization. And it makes it just look a little bit more elegant than when you can actually see um, that circled outline. And here on the left, you can also see that um, I'm, I've just assigned colors and that neutral is just a white color. And on the other um, side, I've assigned a shape that's just not there. So uh, this would be my most usual use case just to make something look more elegant. And uh, something really simple is to use a um, to use an invisible shape for a show and hide container. So this may seem really uh, easy or straightforward to you, and you may ask, why am I just not using you know a, a um, text for a show and feel a show and hide container? But the beauty of an, an invisible shape 
uh, to uh, display a show and hide container is that you can have a lot of text um, and uh, you can um, pretend that you have hyperlinked different words in a text. And uh, if you drop your invisible shape as a show and hide um, container on top of that, you're much more flexible than when using text as a show and hide option. So um, let's just demonstrate that really quickly. So I'm using this with a slightly more colorful background, going to um, add show and hide button, edit button, and then when the item is hidden, I'm choosing an image that um, I have dropped on downloads. This is an invisible shape as well. So when I um, default the container, you can't see anything and I can place it as a kind of like fake hyperlink anywhere on my dashboard. And I'm much more flexible with this floaty kind of tile um, than when I am with using text. Um, this, oh my, um, I seem to have a problem with my light switch, but let's just continue. Um, this you can also see when um, looking at the credits. Of course, I didn't invent all of this. I had a lot of help and a lot of good influence. I'm a big fan of crediting everybody that gave me ideas. So what I did is um, I just placed an invisible shape over um, an article that I took inspiration from. And uh, when you click uh, that person's profile, you should be able to open the article that I was inspired by. So let's continue with uh, KPIs that can't be uh, selected. And here I'm seeing um, a problem, probably because um, I didn't save it as a, um, a TWX, but uh, I have a fallback option in my background. All right. so. Um, Usually when you have a KPI, when you go uh, with your tooltip on that KPI, you can see that it has this outline. And uh, when you click on it, you have this uh, blue background, but um, that's really uh, not necessary. So when you use an invisible shape uh, with your KPI, you have this lovely mouse over that's not um, outlining your uh, KPI. You, um, here we go. Uh, you can still uh, click on it, but it has a very different feel to it. So uh, let's look at a normal KPI. You would use um, measure names and uh, measure values and just choose um, a text field as your max card. Whereas when you use a KPI with an invis invisible shape, you may have guessed it, we're having the max card and shape and, uh, and we're dropping our measure values and measure names on top of that invisible shape. It's just a very elegant way to um, create a lot of dashboards elements. So now let's look at transparent shapes in a viz. I love that kind of visualization that gives you um, some more information on your visualization and that's floating kind of within the space of your um, charts. It saves a lot of space um, and of course, you can only use it if your bar charts are big enough to really um, uh, be able to accommodate that. But um, if this is the case, it's a lovely way to densify um, the, uh, the information. So uh, let's build that bar chart uh, together. We're taking um, order date. And I have uh, made a selection here, I believe. Let's pick a year. 
2020 looks good. And then we're doing uh, the number of orders that we have. Going to bar chart. So now we can either use um, the axis label or we can uh, create uh, another um, axis and call it max 20. We um, just want it to be um, continuous. We create a double axis and synchronize them. There you go. Um, usually I would advise you to uh, use a flexible measure. Um, I will show you that in the next uh, tip, but for this, we'll just use a static 20. So for this, we will use shape. And uh, now I believe you know where I'm going with this. So um, let's just uh, do it the easy way and put the, um, number on the shape. I have created a signal uh, field that um, that is uh, being um, steered through a parameter. Let's put this on shapes. So we have an indicator where my threshold is going to be. Let's do that with the alignment. And, um, and here we go. So let's look at the shapes. So for false, we have a, a circle. And for true, I have assigned in my example, a invisible shape. Again, you go to your shape palette. Um, looking for the He took, um, I think you're in the other, you, you switched to the other workbook. <laughs> That's right. So I have to reload. Thanks for reminding me. Here we go. And here's our invisible shape that I'm assigning. So, um, yeah, so now I have a, um, an indicator, uh, and uh, let's see. Of course, I don't want to have um, any text where I don't have a shape. So I, I only want the shape and the text to be on certain bars. So in my example, I have built this use case where I only want an indicator and a label where I'm below a certain previous month value. So I'm uh, looking at this as it's German and it says um, label. So it um, determines if there should be um, writing or not. And now we should label this as um, a percentage. Let's make it pretty and put this on color as well so we can easily differentiate. So now what we see here is um, we can see um, if a month's value is below a certain threshold. And if it is, then I have an indicator showing up and warning us that we've done worse than the previous year. So let's look at the um, uh, the uh, template uh, real quick. Here um, we have some more calculations with start date and end date, uh, all years and last period. But uh, the idea is the same that we only have an indicator showing up when we want it, and that's how we use invisible shapes. 
So you can see here that, um, yeah, something is actually there, but uh, the tooltip reveals it still, but we don't have any outline that would disturb us. So let's look at labeling um, an axis. Also, I have here the shapes coming up. It obviously lost the path to the shapes that I've uh, set, but that's fine because this way we can more accurately rebuild the visualization. So let's uh, go to country by um, profit and build the vis visualization. And here we are doing a flexible um, second axis. So I'm picking country by region again. I want to see um, profit, but I do not want to see profit um, as, um, as a sum, but I would like to see um, the distribution of profit. So I'm removing the tick mark uh, with analyses. So now I'm adding an average line to see um, how much profit I did on average on in every country. And uh, I love these kind of analyses that tell you more about the outliers and uh, about where my um, median or my average is. So I can get a feeling for um, how much my values vary. And if I'm doing something, anything at all connected to distribution, I usually use um, opacity so I can see where the marks really stack on top of each other. So now I would like to have the, um, I believe the sum of the overall profit included in that visualization. And it, it's usually like uh, one of my goals to have this kind of data densification or information densification. So I'm trying to include that in this visualization as well. And for this, I'm uh, using um, a statement called window max, window underscore max. So here I'm looking at what is the highest value that I'm seeing in this visualization. I want to see the sum of profit. But then I want the sum of profit to be a little bit higher than the highest mark in the visualization is. So I can, I have room to um, plot my totals, right? So let's, uh, let's do it one times uh, zero five. Let's create a dual axis. Let's synchronize the axes. Okay, they are synchronized. So here you can see um, the shape that's just a little bit above the highest value that we have in the visualization. So um, goodbye, I do not want to see this um, axis. There's usually uh, no way around this than just to delete. Uh, tick marks and the title. So now let's go into formatting this. And so now if you new data comes in or if um, you change some parameters or filters, um, it will always be consistently just above the highest value. So here let's choose um, not a circle, but a shape. Let's uh, pick that heat tag and visible shape. All right, so it vanishes, can't be clicked on. It does have a tooltip, so take care to uh, clean up that tooltip. And let's go and get some of profit onto the label.
Um, I'm a bit surprised that we have it double here. Do you have it on the, did you put it on all or did you put it just on? I did oh. put it just on here. So. Let's clean up the label. No, it looks good here. So it's showing me the profit and it's showing me the, I believe it's not showing me sum of profit as well. It's just, Okay, that's really astounding me, but um, same here. It looks like you did what you're doing. <laughs> it should have worked. Ah, oh, Tableau. Well, and you Sometimes. can see that the second one, like, I'm confounded. I would have expected that at least like the label is double or something, but can, um, can you right click at the top, like in the the area where you took away that access? Sorry, are you talking about Tableau or about the? Um... Yeah, yeah, in 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 Tableau, so, if you right right click in the white space that's next to country slash region, let's see if we if we hide that axis, does anything? So up uh, on the right. Uh, yeah, so, you mean? No, uh, the the version above. So hide the uncheck show show header. Okay. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Jen, Jen Snyder asks, is it the aggregation setting? Oh, that might be that we're seeing all the available values, but let's look at my, um, you know. This is why we, yeah, this is why we have the backup versions. <laughs> yeah, <demos>. yeah. <laughs> no. Should I? I think it's a problem. Look at here, we have yeah. some of profit. And on the and other one, we, it's just profit, right? Yeah, but I've checked that it says the aggregation is some. So I'm a little bit like, I'm still confused about that. If you double click, and it does yeah, say I'm, Yeah, that is, it does say. Tableau does weird things sometimes. <laughs> well, I'm really sorry that it uh, didn't work as intended, but I'm sure you'll, um, you'll the understanding and for, for giving, let's just um, pretend uh, that we have a beautiful uh, sum of profit label right here and that we have, voila, it created a second axis that is responsive to new values and coming in. Um, yeah, and will consistently give you um, more information in the viz. Okay, so uh, let's go back to that demo version and assign uh, that transparent shape. It looks like I somehow lost the pathways to some of the shapes in my workbook. So here we go. So uh, if you do remember that hack, just pretend it's this one. The solution looks like this one. So uh, it does look, it's exactly like that one. Okay, good. So it worked. Um, yeah, so my uh, last two are just very simple. They um, just illustrate how you can use, for example, um, a parameter selection on um, uh, in a viz. I'm sure you know how that works. It's quite straightforward, but maybe it's just the idea that it gives you that you can um, show that um, which values are in a selection and which are not, and you don't have these irksome um, white circles. I also love to use it as an indicator of what is in my set and what is out of my set. So I'm working a lot with sets. I would love to hear later if you also use sets to um, filter instead of quick filters, because that's my 
or that's how I am building workbooks right now. And it's always useful for users to know which values are in the set, which are out of the set, especially since I don't want to um, filter a visualization that I use as a filter, but I rather, um, yeah, I rather use these um, indicator dots to imply which, uh, um, which, which values are, are we filtering on. So uh, yeah, be sure to uh, check out the workbook that um, I created and that we talked through on Tableau Public. Here you can reread all the tips uh, that you see. The um, PowerPoint part is in German, but the rest is in English, but PowerPoint works all the same anywhere, anyways. So yeah, hope you enjoyed uh, that and uh, I'm excited for some question. Yeah, that was, was, I, was, I was gonna say that, that was great, Julia. I uh, really appreciate you going through these examples. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Uh, so on the, the, um, the invisible link one, uh, the one where you, where you uh, I think you used the show hide container. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one. Um, we did have a question about how that works on mobile devices. So have you had any, any or seen any issues where, um, you know, people won't be able, or, you know, like the, the link just doesn't appear in the right place on the mobile, uh, on the mobile, uh, on a mobile device or, or, you know, if people are switching their, their um, browser to be bigger or smaller. Um, and if so, how have you sort of worked around that? Yeah, I love that question because I'm just now getting into mobile design for uh, dashboards. I don't have um, really created a mobile design yet. Um, with a floating um, floating object, there's always a um, yeah, there's always a chance that it may not end up where you want it to, um, depending on the browser and so on and so on. Um, so that's why I usually don't use floating objects. So my tip would be to um, make it as big as possible. Um, like here, when you see the credits, um, the area that the invisible shape takes up is, is quite large um, to be safe with that. But um, yeah, you're right. That's definitely something that um, yeah, that is more more difficult. And if you want to really have it watertight, you should probably not use it. Have you have you tried mold the? So I, I see you still have the like the phone view showing like up at the very top under dashboard. You've got the default, and then you've got the phone view and device preview. Yeah. Do you do you use device preview a lot in, no, when you're working? Okay. I don't. I really I really don't because I just. Um, I just hate the options uh, that I have to rearrange for a phone layout. So I would always build a new dashboard for a phone layout because I also, first of all, I think it's a different user journey and I think it's a different kind of analytical approach. If you have a cell phone, you don't have the same mindset to um, analyze data. So if I have a cell phone, I would just start to think about the dashboard just from, from a whole different perspective. Um, and if you do have great resources about mobile phone layout, please send them to me. I'm waiting for my first book on mobile, uh, um, on um, dashboards on a mobile layout. But I'm also never using like the, um, like the uh, thing where you can do like a flexible width. Yeah. I'm always using fixed size. I have enough issues as it is with different browsers and <laughs> uploading it on Tableau server. It's such a hackle. I um, yeah, I'm so frustrated every time I load up a dashboard and it just nothing fits anymore. So, yeah, I would um, if you if you do a mobile layout, just make a separate dashboard. I call it M underscore show and height container. Build it all from scratch. Make the make the size here um, uh, for uh, suitable for phone layout and then try it from there. That would be my advice. But um, I do not have a lot of a lot of experience, but I would love to uh, get into that topic more. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I really love your answer. I love, I love that idea of, well, yeah, you could read, you could, you know, try to try to squish your dashboard onto a smaller device, but, but really, what are the people who are using that smaller device? What are they really looking for? Are they looking for that same data in, in the same format, just smaller, or are they coming at it from a completely different perspective? 
And if so, do you need to show them some, some completely different data and perhaps with the option to drill into the larger dashboard on a different screen? Um, also, the layouts that they suggest they're terrible. They're like, so um, bad. <laughs> can actually just just for kicks, can you click the device preview when yeah, uh, someone someone asks? Let's like, let's see what happens. Well, that's not yeah. So so horrible let's, let's, at the top. It is. Look at <laughs> look at this. It's um. And and then you try to do a custom one, and but then you realize it's so limited like what you can actually do. Like if you change here, the kind of how the filter is displayed and you switch it up to a line, then it changes it for the desktop dashboard as well. And then it doesn't fit over there. So no, in my opinion, it never goes together. You have to do a completely different dashboard with the same elements, but just use them really differently. Again, I love that answer. Um, if, if anyone has different opinions, voice them in the chat. Maybe yeah, please in, do. Yeah, <laughs> or you know, we have a presenter form. So if you have experience with mobile, um, with mobile design of dashboards, um, feel we we really would want to uh, would love to see some folks you know show show some of those mobile dashboards and tell us about you know what has worked and what what hasn't worked. Um, and and yeah, I've, no, I've just using D three is not an option. <laughs> We're talking Tableau here, Matthew. Um, uh, I've, I've just ordered more mobile data visualization and it's seriously the first book that I found on um, on dashboards for mobiles. I've been looking for a, for a while now, so I'm, I love books. I have a um, whole library on data with books, so please, um, yeah, please uh, give me your tips and tricks. Um, and Andrew mentioned what about uh, Tableau metrics? It sounds like metrics might be it might be another option. But again, it's one of those using metrics as a whole different, um, you know, way into a dashboard. Um, so that's that's an, an interesting thought. Um, all right, let's. I feel like we might have had some more questions that I have have missed. Um, so Julia, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you kind of go through uh, the comments um, and feel free to reply there. Um, and we are going to finish uh, with a quick video. Um, so Ginny couldn't be here today, um, but she and I uh, did our, our final session uh, of, um, of our, our date calc or our, our calculations, uh, you know, program, I guess, of measures, dimensions, and calcs. Oh my. Um, so we're going to play that video uh, and enjoy. All right. Welcome back for our third and final part of our calculations how-to. Uh, we're going to do everyone's favorite, which is date calculations. All right, so I'm going to start off with date part and date name. These are both date field calculations. As you can see here, our data lists the date of different events. So let's say we want to isolate the month of each event, and we can do this using a date part calculation. So we're going to start off by looking at the month of the event. So you can see here, it is a really simple calculation. We start off with the date part and open parenthesis, and then the part of the date that you want to isolate. In our case, it's going to be month, followed by a comma and the field that you want to take that date part from and close parenthesis. So if I double click and add this to the view, you can see that it is working correctly. Here is April 1st and the month is four. August 18th, then the month is eight, and August 28th, and again, the month is eight. So we can also do this with other date parts, such as day, and it's just a very simple replacement here. Where we had month before, we're just going to insert day. You can do this with quarter. You can do it with year. And if we add that to our viz as well, we're seeing that now it's getting some funky formatting. And you can actually go in and fix that. If you right click on measure values and go to format, you can change this from a two place decimal number to a standard number, which is no decimal places. All right, so we're seeing it is all again working correctly. So we have four is the month, one is the day for April 1st, eight and 18 for August 18th, eight and 28 for August 28th. Now, the reason this is working is because I have the event name in here, but if I didn't, 
because there are two events on August 18th, if we took that out, you're seeing that the month and day are summing. And this is uh, something you can fix either by going to the measure and changing it from sum to either a min or a max. It will work both ways. Or you can um, change it from being a measure to being a discrete value, which is actually what we're going to do in our next calculation. If we want the month and day separated by a slash mark, we can do that. And we can do that by wrapping it in a string. So we take our month of event calculation, wrap it in a string. We add a slash mark. You could also use a hyphen here, whatever symbol that you want to separate the month and the day. And then you can put the string around your day of event and you'll have month slash day. If we add this to our viz, we can see four slash one for April 1st, eight slash 18 and eight slash 28, working as expected. All right, so one last thing. What if you wanted to have the name of the month, so April instead of the four, or August instead of the eight, in addition to the numeric day. You can do that with a slightly different calculation called date name. So instead of typing out date part, we're gonna type out date name, followed by the same parentheses, the month, which is the date name that we want, a comma and the field, close parentheses, and we're going to add a space after that, and then the string of our day of event. So now if we add that to the viz, April 1, August 18, and August 28. So those are just a couple of uh, date calculations to get us started, and now Roshi is going to talk about the date calculation. So what does date do? It lets you create a date, and what can you create a date from? A whole bunch of things. So we've got multiple options. You can use date to create a date from a string. So July 19th, 2023, all spelled out. Um, you can use it to create a date from a number. So basically it's the number or the day number since July, or sorry, January 1st, 1900. So this is something you might see in Excel. Sometimes Excel will, will format your date as a number. This is that same thing, only it lets you convert that number into um, a date. And then you can also create a date from another date. Um, and here we're gonna actually uh, convert a date time into a date. So we're looking at survey response time. So, you know, you see April 5th, 2021, 10.15 and AM and or 10.15 and 54 seconds AM. Well, I don't need all of the time aspects uh, of this date time. I just want the date. And then I wanna be able to use that date in calculations. So you could change the data type of recorded on make it a, from change it from a date time to a date, but sometimes you need both. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> Instead, we're going to use the date function. So uh, here we see um, the date function in, in action. Yeah. You yeah. basically yeah. type in date and then you put in yeah. whatever yeah. you're converting into a date in the parentheses. Um, and Tableau will do its magic. And when we add that to the view, we will see and, and we convert it. <laughs> When we add that to the view as a, as a discrete element, we'll see that all of those the time elements just dropped right out. And now we just have the date the way we want it. And again, because we didn't just change the default for recorded on, we can now use the date time and the date however we need to in, this, in the rest of this workbook. <laughs> Next, I'm going to show you how to do today and now. So these are date and date time calculations. Today is a date calculation, and now is a date time calculation. So here we have those same seven students and the, the surveys that they took two years back to back. So the, the date that they took the survey each year is recorded. So what if I wanted to know how many days before today that they completed the survey? Well, first let's look at today, which is a calculation in and of itself. All it is is the word today, followed by an open and a closed parentheses. Simple, right? So if I add that to the viz as a discrete measure, oh, that's a little bit busy. So here we have uh, 7-11-22, that's today. 
And we're going to compare that to each of the days that they took the survey. So we're going to compare that to April 5th of 2021 and to April 8th, 2022, et cetera. So how am I going to do that? It's going to be another calculation, one that I call days before today. So it's just taking today and subtracting the date that it was recorded on, the date that the survey was recorded on. All right, so if I look at how many days before today that is, well, I don't want to add it as a continuous value, so I'm going to right click and add it to our text box and see the actual number of days. So here we have survey A was completed on 4 5 2021. That was 462 days before today. And then they completed it again on April 8th of 2022, which was 94 days before today. So now, now is another calculation very similar to today. It is simply the word now followed by an open and closed parenthesis. And so the difference between that is it not only includes today's date, but also the exact time that you have put that calculation into the viz. So 11, 20, 59 a.m. at the time that we are recording this. And if you wanted, you could subtract the recorded on date time from the now calculation. However, it's generally not advised that you use this unless you have a really good reason because it does create performance issues with live data. And that's all I've got for today and now. And now Roshi is going to show you how to add and subtract dates. So in uh, Jenny's calculation of two, uh, or sorry, days before today, she just used a simple subtraction. Uh, we're going to use a different function called date diff that does much the same thing, but it has a little bit more flexibility. So if we look at days before today, the date diff variation, um, we'll see that that it, um, that there's different uh, options that are listed here that are commented out. Um, we can look at a date diff for at the day level, at the week level, month, quarter, or year. Any date part um, you can you know that is in Tableau, you can use. You can even use hour if you have a date time. Um, so the way date diff works is you type in date diff, you put in your parentheses, and then you define, okay, what are you, what, what is the, the, the date part that you're, that you're doing the diff, diff on? Is it day, week, whatever? Um, and then you put in your start date, which here is recorded on. So we're going to see again, how many days has it been since the, the survey was recorded? And then the end date, which in the, our case is today. Um, this is a little different from that subtraction that Ginny showed earlier, where it was today minus recorded on. Here we're doing the start date and then the end date in the parentheses. And now when we add this to the view, we'll see that we get the exact same um, counts as we did in the on the previous tab. Um, you know, 462 days uh, since April 5th, 2021, only 94 since April 8th, 2022. So um, again, you can use all those other variations too if you want to look at week or month or quarter or year. Um, and which is why date diff is, is a good function to have. Um, it's not just uh, the date, the, you know, the number of days, you can, you can look at the number of weeks, um, number of months, et cetera, all the way um, down. If we'd, and there is rounding, of course. So if we <laughs> look at year, um, you know, it's been zero years since April of 2022, but one, one year um, and change since April of 2021. All right. So one of the things that we might want to do with the survey data is figure out, okay, when do we expect our next response? So um, let's look ahead, look, go ahead and look at the expected next uh, response field. So here, instead of looking at, the, uh, not, instead of doing date math between two dates, we're actually going to add time to a, a, a date. So we're going to look at our, our next, uh, you know, where we, we expect these surveys to be done every year. So we're going to add a year to our recorded on to see when when do we expect the next response to come in. Um, so date add, the way date add works is very similar to date diff. <laughs> you have, uh, you know, you type in date add, you have your parentheses, and then you have the date part that you're doing the math on. Um, you then add in an interval. So in this case, it's one, it's one year in the future. Um, like what's what's one year from and then the date that you want to do the date, uh, the date math with. So give me one year from the last uh, recorded on date. So when we add that to the view, we 
we'll see that for the April 2021, we expect to get the next response in you know, April 5th, 2022. For um, the April 8th response, uh, we expect the next response to be about a year later on April 8th of 2023. Um, so what if, what if we wanted to uh, send a reminder about a month before that, that next expected response date? We can do that uh, with a negative date add. So um, date add intervals can be po both positive or negative. You can add a year, you can add a month, you can add a week, or you can subtract a week. And the, and the way to do that is just to add a negative before whatever that interval is. So again, here we have date add. We're gonna add a month, but it's gonna be a negative one month <laughs> uh, to the expected ne next response. So if we expected our response in April, uh, on April 8th of 2023 for uh, survey uh, respondent A, when we add this um, field, we should now see something like March 8th, 2023 in that uh, first row. And there we go, we got March 8th, 2023 um, under April 8th, 2023. So, Date add, you can do both positive add or you can basically subtract time by uh, doing a negative add. So that's it for date add. So I'm going to show you two ways to do date parse. Um, I'm going to show you the right way to do it. And then I'm going to show you the cheating way to do it, which is the way I learned how to do it. So this is a date field calculation that converts a string to a date. And sometimes I have a list of terms for students and I want to add in a field for say their first day of class or census day or something that is not already included in the data. So I can write a calculation for this instead. So we're going to look at the first day of class. So this is kind of a nested calculation. We're gonna start with date parse which is going to create our date. And we're going to tell it the format we want to use. So month followed by day, comma, and year. So if the term is spring 2022, then I want the date to be January 18th, 2022. That's the first date of class for the spring term. Uh, but if the term registered is summer, then we want the first day of class to be June 27th. And if the first, if the term is fall, then the first day of class needs to be August 18th. And so we're going to end our if then calculation. And we're going to wrap this whole thing in that date function that Roshni showed you a few minutes ago. All right, so when we click OK and add that to our text box as a discrete value, we will see, sure enough, working correctly. So first day of classes for spring is January 18th, for summer, June 27th, and for fall, August 18th. So that's the right way to do date parse and convert it into a date. But if you're me, um, you learn to do it by cheating. So essentially what I used to do was I would just write my, my if then calculation. So you saw this in the previous example, these are the terms and these are the dates for the first day of class. So when I write it like that, it is a string. It is not a date. So the way I learned to do this was to first create that string and then click and go to default properties, sorry, change data type and change it to a date. And that took my string and changed it to a date. Let's see that again. So if I have it as a string, and now it's a date. All right, so if I didn't want to do it that way, the other correct way would be to just take that date parse of the first day of class string and then wrap it in the date function. So that's another shortcut way to get to that first day of class. And we see that all three ways do work correctly. So Ginny, can you show the, the date conversion on, on that, the, what you call the wrong way one more time? The wrong way. 
it's really, I don't think it's the wrong way. <laughs> it's really simple. You just click on that down arrow, go to change data type, and you see it's currently classified as a string. You just change that string to a date. Now that did mess up our calculated field where it turns it into a date manu or using a calculation, but there it is. So if you if you now right click on that that field that you just changed, um, it looks like it's now a calculated field. So can we look at that calculated field and edit it? Yes, I can. So you can hey, see when you change the date of the data type, it actually alters your calculated field to match the original one that we did write out. So this is this is one of those examples of of hey, Tableau does weird things, but sometimes sometimes when Tableau does weird things. It can help you. You can actually reverse engineer some of some of what Tableau's done. Um, I find it really helpful on date calcs and sometimes on other calcs as well, just to try to figure out like, okay, if I want to do this on something else, what is it that happened here? Exactly. So I'm going to turn right. it over to Roshni to do fiscal year because that's something I don't want anything to do with. Um, I also want nothing to do with fiscal years, at least as far as Tableau is concerned, but Tableau does have some, some fiscal year functionality. Um, I'm going to preface all of this with it doesn't always work the way you want it to work, and it doesn't always work at all. <laughs> so um, if you've ever, uh, you know, had to, to use fiscal, fiscal years, um, Tableau does have a nifty feature that lets you automatically convert fiscal years. So here we're looking at all of the, the dates in a, in a date scaffold um, data source, which really is just like one row for every day between 2015 and 2030. We've got the, 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 the year, the quarter, um, and the month all pulled out of that date field. Um, if we wanted to see what does that look like for fiscal years, we can do that by right clicking on the date and then um, going to default properties. And at the very bottom of that menu, you'll see fiscal year charts. This only shows up for dates because non-dates have no fiscal year, right? <laughs> um, but you can choose from here what you want your fiscal year start to be. So if we were to change this to July before you click anything, Jenny, I'm just going to want, want people to look at what Q1 looks like. So Q1 is right now is January, February, and March. Q2 is April through June. So now when we click July, we'll see that actually change over. So now here, Q1 is July through September, and Q2 is October through, or sorry, October through December. And that's exactly what we would want if our fiscal year started in July, assuming that your fiscal year quarters are actually quarters, three months, and, and so on. Um, this is all great. You even see up at the top in the years, you'll see that you know the, the year is spelled out um, FY space 2015. So it's like, hey, hey, this is an irregular year user of this dashboard. Um, but that's as far as, as fiscal years um, go, basically, <laughs> uh, in, in Tableau. Um, if you try to do calculations for fiscal years, so let's say you wanted to try to, to get the, the fiscal quarter of a date, um, those fiscal quarters are not going to show up right. It's still going to, um, it's, it's more likely than not, <laughs> at least for as far as I've seen, uh, going to default back to, you know, January being quarter one and so on. Um, so fiscal years are great. They just don't often work well with with date calcs. Um, there's also some fun in terms of formatting. So we've, you know, I, I remember there was a a, um, a post in our HE tug or, or our higher ed Slack about hey wanting to reformat the FY 2015 and remove the space. Well, far as I remember, that didn't work. <laughs> um, there was no real way to really edit edit some of that that formatting the way that we want it to be edited. Um, so fiscal years are. Great in that Tableau will let you do an automatic change, but they're not really all that that robust and, and functional after that. So one of the things that that I end up often doing is putting a, together a data source outside of Tableau that does all of my fiscal year um, partitioning. So you know I can I have my list of dates and I and I can note that this goes into this fiscal year. This is this quarter of this fiscal year and so on. Um, and that's actually what that date scaffold <laughs> uh, data source kind of does. You know, it gives us all of these dates and we can specify in the separate data source, this is what we want these dates to be. And then, then we can join that in. And it's something that's more reusable. So you don't have to do a bunch of calculations in Tableau to, and cross your fingers that they work right. Um, you actually just have them in a shared reusable data source, um, which is 
way better, <laughs> way better. So that's me and my soapbox on fiscal years. Ginny, on to you. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, kind of segueing right into date formatting because there are a couple ways to format your dates once it's in the view and before that I do want to show you. So if you want to alter the default format of your entire date field, you do that in the data pane. If you just want to alter the format for the viz, you do that in your work pane. So let's say we have our date field and we want to alter the format for the entire field. So first you find your field in the data pane, you click on your arrow and go to default properties and date format. So from there, you have a list of a lot of different date formats that you can choose from. So let's just choose this one at random, hit OK, and we see that the date that was already in our viz has changed to that new format that we selected. Another thing that you'll mention or that you'll notice under this default properties is at the very bottom, there is a custom field that you can format any way that you want. So if you're me and you spend a lot of time submitting data sets to the National Student Clearinghouse, you may want to go ahead and type in year, 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 month, month, day, day. And there is your required data field for that National Student Clearinghouse submission in the correct format. All right, so let's say you don't necessarily want to change that date format everywhere. You just want to change it in the viz, in the view that you're looking at. So here we have our default format, and then here we have our viz format. So if I just want to change it in the viz, I can come here. There are a lot of different selections down here. You might have seen me do that earlier, but you can also go to this format. You can change the format in the header, or you can change the format in the pane. So if I wanted to go and change this to say a more standard version separated by slash marks, I click on that option, you already see that change has been reflected. And you can just come through here and, sh and choose any uh, different format that you want, or again, create another custom format. So those so, are a few ways. So Ginny, what if, what mm -hmm. if I wanted to show just the week? I, I noticed there's one that was like year and week number. What if I wanted to show just the week? Is there a way to easily get to that? So if you just want to show the week as a uh, custom? Yep. That's so cool. Just type in www. And there you have it. The week number for that date. Awesome. And that's it. That is it. Thanks for sticking with us for all three parts of our calculation how-tos. So I am gonna just finish up some final closing slides. Um, please let us know what you thought of today's meeting. Um, and there's uh, links in the chat if you just scroll up just a little bit. Um, we, are, we do have our next uh, HE tug scheduled for August 16th. Um, you can go ahead and register at the link that's there. Um, I'm really excited about this This one. Um, we're gonna meet Soraya from, from Duke. Um, Laura Urcioli, uh, sounds like ravioli, uh, is gonna be presenting on tooltips, um, including going from like baseline, here's how you edit a tooltip all the way to some dynamic viz and tooltips. Um, it's a really cool uh, set of presentations. And then uh, Jen Schelling is gonna kind of take us, take us a step back and, and uh, share how uh, Gestalt principles and pre-attentive attributes and, and a whole bunch of other um, sort of visualization research um, can, can help us build better vi data visualizations. Um, and if you want to present, or if, whether it's a full-on presentation, whether it's, you know, a, a five, 10-minute um, thing on, you know, on tips and tricks, or if you just want us to interview you and, you know, get your own set of lightning round uh, questions, um, let us know. The, the link to present is also in the chat. So thank you, everyone. Um,